You know, place that was very dangerous. We had been there many times before. A lot of the times we'd gone in there, we'd gotten into a gunfight. Uh, and on that night, we launched on that mission to get this uh, Al Qaeda leader. I saw individuals who would gladly harm, kill, defile uh, women and children, uh, and, and torture people. And uh, they had set up an ambush line, and we walked right into that ambush. So myself and my teammates got uh, all shot up. There are six main key principles. Reframe the mindset, stay positive, develop resilience, take ownership, embrace change, and maintain a sense of purpose. If you want to build a business, if you want to have better grades, if you want to, there's work that has to be put in, and oftentimes that work is uncomfortable. We would rather be comfortable. If you don't consistently do things that maybe you don't want to do, you're never gonna build an overcome mind. And when hard things happen, you're gonna fold and crumble because you have not built any resilience within yourself. My wins just happen to be slightly a little bit more than my, than my failures. I fail all the time. 70% of leadership is leading yourself. And if you can do that successfully, especially through problems, hardship, adversity. That's when you will find success in your life. And Overcome really lays that out. The Avenue of the Strongest is a podcast dedicated to exploring the lives and experiences of the most inspiring individuals from around the world. Each episode features interviews with fascinating guests who share their insights and wisdom on a variety of topics, including education, impact, motivation, health, and learning. Here are your hosts, Aniette Chowdhury and Vlad Suleiman. Over the last year, 86.6% of our regular viewers have not yet hit the subscription button. Your subscription means a lot to us. It's a small gesture on your end and a huge leap forward for our channel. If you wouldn't mind, we would love to ask you if you found our channel informative and engaging, if you can please hit that subscription button. Your subscription means a lot to us. It allows us to go ahead and continue to put out great content, better guests, and as always, we will always put out two episodes per week. Thank you so much. So as you already mentioned, there are six main key principles to reframe the mindset, stay positive, develop resilience, take ownership, embrace change, and maintain a sense of purpose. So could you please um, share which one is the most important uh, according, according to you? I think the, the overcome mindset is born out of uh, discomfort. That's the reality. So I would say out of any of them, you have to get uncomfortable. Um, and what does that mean? Well, that means you have to do things that you may not like. You have to um, push yourself a little bit out of your comfort zone. I always like to use fitness as an example because in fitness, whether you want to be a faster runner or you want to be stronger, um, you are going to have to get a little bit uncomfortable. You're going to have to sweat a little bit through the work you're doing. Your muscles are going to have to strain. Your lungs are going to hurt. You're going to have to breathe harder. Your muscles are going to hurt because you're running faster. There's things that you have to do. Life is no different. If you want to build a business, if you want to have better grades, if you want to, there's work that has to be put in. And oftentimes that work is uncomfortable. We would rather be comfortable. Um, right. You know, we'd rather, you know, hey, if I can get by with a C and I can do this level of work, then oftentimes people are settling for that because it's comfortable, it's easy. But in order to get an A, it takes a lot more work. It takes, I've got to study more. Maybe I'm not good in this subject. Maybe I'm not that great in math. So I, I need a I need a tutor. Or I need to find someone who can help me. I had to do that when I went through college. <laughs> True story. When I was in the uh, when I was in the Navy and I got selected for an officer commissioning program, um, I was not strong in math in high school. So here I am, I'm 26 years old. I'm putting in packages to go to college. And I totally bombed like the math portion. They were like, hey, you you graded in at a third grade level. Like most of the kids that would ever listen wow. to this would, would are smarter than me in math. Um, so I really had to study hard. I had to find people to help train me in math. And all the way through college, I always had um, 
uh, tutors and mentors. I would find people who were good in that subject. And I would say, hey, man, can I study with you so I can learn? Um, and I graduated with a super high GPA. I graduated summa cum laude from college, but I had to work very hard at it. Um, and that is what builds an overcome mindset. I tell people an overcome mindset is not a magical button that you push when things go wrong. It's not like, oh, something bad's happened in my life. Suddenly I'm going to overcome. If you don't consistently do some things that are hard, if you don't consistently do things that maybe you don't want to do, you're never going to build an overcome mindset. And when hard things happen, you're going to fold and crumble because you have not built any resilience within yourself. An overcome mindset takes time. And one of the great things, Vlad, you nailed it. One of the great things about failures, if you overcame that failure, um, if you failed and got back up and went after it again, or at least got back up and went in a different direction, that helps build an overcome mindset tremendously. And failures are coming for all of us. Everybody's going to fail at some point. Everybody's going to have a setback. Everybody's going to have problems. But the more times you have pushed yourself to be uncomfortable, to, to get out of your comfort zone, whether it's physically, mentally, emotionally, socially, or spiritually, that's what truly builds it. And I think for anyone out there who is successful, um, I remember a quote, Ray Kroc, who created McDonald's one time was asked, hey, what's the single greatest trait that enabled you to be successful with this company? And they were like, was it leadership? Was it money management? Was it, you know, picking the right market and all this stuff? And he was like, no, it was uh, persistence. It was resilience. You know, when we thought we could not do this, when we thought we were going to fail, um, we kept going. And, and and that is my final component of the overcome mindset. A lot of people will quit when they're right on the verge of success because sometimes it's like climbing a mountain. That last climb to get to the peak sometimes is the hardest. In climbing, they call that the crux, the crux of the climb. And oftentimes people get, they're right there, but it gets so hard and they're tired and they're like, I don't think I can do this anymore. And they're like, I'm going to quit. When the reality is yeah. that we're right on the tipping point of success. And that mm -hmm. small push at the end is probably one of the greatest things that enables success. And that is the overcome mindset. This podcast is sponsored by Argo Prep, an award-winning educational publisher serving over a million students nationwide. If you're a kindergarten to eighth grade teacher or principal, be sure to check out our supplementary workbooks to get your students ready for standardized state testing. We cover all subjects from kindergarten to eighth grade. Use the coupon code AVENUE for a 25% discount off of all purchase orders. Visit us today at argoprep.com slash store. We failed so many times. I fail every day in my life. You know, I fail every day. It's just that I my my wins just happen to be slightly a little bit more than my than my failures. I fail all the time, uh, but we just you know we always keep on going, and that's that's. I, I, but again, I'm very fortunate because of my upbringing, because of those difficulties that I had in my personal childhood. Uh, but Jason, as you were talking, I was looking at your incredible uh, uh, ink work over here, and I saw. Yes, was it yesterday or the other day? You posted you you got some new ink ink work done. Is that correct? Yep. Wow, I, that, um, that looks incredible. Yeah, thanks, man. I mean, I um, this will be. It's a tattoo I've thought about for many years. I don't know if you can see my scar. So this is yeah. uh, where um, I had a bullet enter here. And I had a bullet enter in my forearm here. Um, and then it did a lot of damage coming out of the back of my arm. I know it's probably hard. So they were doing it like machinery, although any place where there's visible scars, it's going to be open and then it'll be a tribute to okay. brothers lost. So I'm a, I'm a fan, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm, I'm a creative guy. I like, I like writing. I like, inspiring people. I like helping the people take action. Tattoos are a form of artwork and creativity. And man, it's pretty amazing when you can go to someone and you can say, hey, here's my idea. They can translate it into art. And that's art that you carry with you that is a part of you. I mean, every tattoo I have uh, represents something about my life, a belief or, or something that's occurred. So this tattoo represents the night I was wounded. So 
you know, your story of surviving that 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 particular day is incredibly inspiring. Um, can you can you walk us through that day? Do you do you do you remember like early like? I'm just, I, I know you talk about it often. I'm sure you had to tell the story uh, quite a few times. But can you, for for our audience, can you can you can you talk to us a little bit more about that day? Yeah. So we were at the end of our deployment in Iraq. Um, regardless of individuals' beliefs on Iraq, there are people you know who war is a terrible thing, uh, and there are people who say, "Oh, well, you know, you guys were there and disrupted, and the problem maybe they're." Worse is terrible, but they're also very evil people, and we witnessed many of those evil people. I saw individuals who would gladly um, harm, kill, defile uh, women and children, uh, and and torture people. Uh, and you know that was part of our mission. I'll be honest. In Iraq, it was probably one of the greatest deployments I ever did because we went after mid-level and high-level people who were tied to many of these uh, atrocious and violent things. Um, on that night, uh, at the very end of our deployment, we were actually targeting the number one leader in the western province of Iraq, Lombard province. In a place that was very dangerous, we had been there many times before. For a lot of the times we had gone in there, we had gotten into gunfights. Uh, and on that night, we launched on that mission to get this uh, al-Qaeda leader um, we landed on our first target and he was not there. And, you know, that's kind of life, you know, sometimes you think you're going to get the win, you're going to close the deal, you're going to do whatever. And it doesn't happen. I mean, it's no different in combat. And we thought it was going to be a quiet night. We thought that, you know, we may gather a little bit of intelligence from stuff that was on the target. We did happen to find a lot of IED equipment. We found explosives and some weapons and we were going to, uh, bl uh, blow that stuff up. And then, and then call it a night. But um, about 3 a.m., we um, <clears throat> our snipers were watching. They saw some bad guys come out of this building. Um, they ran across the street and hid in some vegetation. My boss said, hey, can you take your team? Let's go walk these guys down. Let's find out who they are. And we did. Uh, and what we didn't know was that our number one leader had left the house we were in. He went to the house about 150 yards away. He had a large security detail. We estimate between 12 to 15 uh, men, and uh, they had set up an ambush line, and we walked right into that ambush. So myself and my teammates got uh, all shot up. Uh, I was hit eight times between my body and body armor. I took two rounds in the left arm, uh, and I took a round in the face. Uh, that did a lot of damage. Um, I, owe, I, I was pinned down out front, uh, pinned down by one of the machine guns. Um, and thankfully I owe my life to my teammates, uh, to, we have an aircraft, the air force AC-130 gunship for, for any of the kids out there that play call of duty. I'm sure they're very familiar with that aircraft. Um, but, uh, pretty amazing. And I owe my life to those guys and I owe my life to my teammates who fought and managed to get me, pulled me back, um, got a tourniquet on my arm and ended up saving me. You know, the overcome mindset played a little bit in there uh, because I had to focus on, I tell, tell a lot of people I talk about in my book, it was probably the greatest fatigue I've ever felt. I wanted to go to sleep. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a common thing when traumatic events happen, when people get injured, if you lose blood or um, there's a natural tendency, the body wants to shut down. And oftentimes that's manifested in, well, I'm just tired. I want to go to sleep. Uh, but oftentimes if you do that, you won't wake up. And I knew that. Yeah. And I told myself, you got to stay awake, stay alive. No matter how tired you get, you got to drive through that. And, um, and that I, I contribute some of that to helping me to come home. You know, I think there was probably a little bit of divine intervention. Uh, but above all that enabled me to come home. So, um, obviously pretty severe injuries, uh, took, um, uh, four years and almost 40 surgeries to put me back together. But um, but I, I don't allow it to become an excuse to not do things. I still work out. I still push myself. There are certain things. I can't bend my arm any further than this. I can't extend it any further than that. I still have some nerve damage. But so what? So what? Right. I figure out what I can right. do. Um, certain things I can't do, you know, but 
I don't care. I okay, so I can't do that, but I can do this. And I think so often in this life, people focus on, well, I can't do this, so I won't do anything. And that's right. just the wrong mindset, man. So that night definitely had an impact. But in my mind, it became a positive impact. I, I turned yeah. I turned something negative into something positive and, and drove forward. I mean, I wasn't able to, you know, we talk about often having a goal um, that we wanted to accomplish. One of my goals was I wanted to continue to stay in the SEAL teams and be a SEAL. Unfortunately, that didn't. I was able to stay, but I wasn't able to be operational. I was never able to work as a SEAL in combat or in training again. I worked administrative. I worked in the office. I did training. I worked some special projects before I finally retired from the Navy. <clears throat> but that's a great example of, hey, I want this. But instead, what started to happen as I figured out B was, wow, you know, I'm, I'm starting to write a lot. I'm starting to create these positive messages. I'm trying to lift others up. And that drove me down a whole new road. I never once, if you had told me years ago when I was in the steel team, hey man, someday you're going to be an author and a motivational speaker. Right. And I would have been like, what? <laughs> you know, no way. And now look at me, you know, I'm, I'm out there motivating, inspiring people across this country and even internationally. Yeah. Well, I can sum it up in three words, victor, not victim. So do you have any, any advice, uh, you know, on top of mind that you can give to our current teenagers, high schoolers? They're facing their own unique set of issues right now. We've talked a little bit, a lot about actually about the phones and instant gratification and, and, and all these thoughts around, you know, I'm so scared that if I post something that someone's going to write one negative thing about me. Uh, any general piece of advice that you can benefit from? Uh, Every piece of advice you've given already applies to them. <laughs> but if there's something you right now you can tell them, what would it be? There is a pervading idea uh, that is impacting, at least here in the United States of America. I, I'm not sure about abroad. Um, and the idea is that, hey, we'll all be better off if we're equal. And if you're not good at something, then we want to bring the standards down so that everybody feels better about themselves. And that's just, A, not true. No one who was ever successful <laughs> accomplished it by, by steadily. Um, and, and here's the interesting thing. Every single person has something exceptional residing inside them. So that you have some incredible, amazing talent. Maybe you just, you can look at math and you can just figure it out. My, my son is like this. He can look at math. When he was in school, the teachers would be like, hey, you have to do, you have to show your work. And he's like, and he was young and he'd be like, well, I just know the answer. You know, and he didn't cheat. He just knew. He just had this thing with numbers. Or maybe you're an amazingly talented uh, singer and you just have this great voice. Or maybe you're just naturally strong, you know, or maybe you're just super creative and, and how you put things together. Everyone has some talent that lies within them. And, and what we're telling kids today is, hey, um, we don't want you to be exceptional because if you're exceptional, it makes this person feel bad. That's the wrong answer, man. If we do that, maybe the kid that's not exceptional in math may be amazingly except, exceptional in writing. But if we don't allow him to go or her to go down that path and figure that out, maybe they haven't uncovered their their secret talent. Sometimes it takes years to figure that out. My youngest daughter, um, it took her a while to figure out what her talent was. Um, she didn't start playing the guitar until she was probably 15, I think. Now she plays in the top level for wow. um, one of our companies. Man, she she's doing a tour this summer. She shreds on a guitar. That wow. became one of her superpowers. Everybody has superpowers. So you need to find yours. And the only way you're going to find yours is by getting out and trying stuff. And you may figure out, well, I'm not good at this. And don't allow that to become this negative mindset like, oh, I'm not good at this. So what? If you're not good at that, something inside you, everyone, everyone has some sort of exceptional talent lying within them. And sometimes it takes years to uncover it. I didn't start writing and speaking until I was in my late 30s. 
you know, and now I'm a highly in demand speaker. I never would have known that. I didn't know that when I was in the military. Yeah. I wasn't doing that. So don't buy into this idea that you shouldn't be exceptional. Figure out what is your superpower and then just crush it, man. Go all in on it. Be exceptional and be proud of it. That's 100% agreed. Uh, everybody has a superpower, but it just takes time to identify that. It can take years, maybe if you're lucky, some weeks or months, but definitely years. So and that's, it's all about trying until you can find something. Uh, Vlad, I'll pass it over to you. Yeah. I would like to uh, hear a little bit about your books, The Trident and The Overcome. Could you please give our, our listeners some overview about those books and uh, what will it teach? So The Trident is my memoir. I mean, it is, but if anything, when I tell people, The Trident is a story of failure. It's a story of redemption. It's a story of leadership, resilience, and it's a love story. Um, a lot of people don't realize that the Trident follows the journey of when I met my wife all the way through to uh, after I was wounded and, and recovered and got out of the military. It wasn't intentionally designed to be a leadership book, but it has become a leadership book. A lot of people see the lessons that are in it. And it is a great story for young people to understand that, um, yeah, success doesn't happen overnight. There's no blink of an eye. And if you messed up or if you failed or if you have been injured or you've had some traumatic event, whatever it is, it's never too late to recover and, and drive forward and figure it out. Uh, I'm living proof of that. So that, that, that is really the trident. Um, Overcome, the second book, became the how-to. So many people read the trident and said, well, how did you do that? Like, how did you do these things? How, you know, you say you can choose to you know, drive forward out of that hospital bed, but how did you do that? And over be, Overcome became a, a one, um, it taught you how to be a better leader of yourself. Um, I meet a lot of people, maybe people listening to this podcast who will say to me, I'm not a leader, but you are a leader. Unless you are still living at home and your parents are making all the decisions for you, which may be the case, but that's okay. Someday you're going to leave. And when that occurs, you are going to start making decisions. If you are making decisions, any decision for yourself, if you decide what clothes you're going to wear for that day, you are a leader. You are leading yourself. If you decide what you're going to watch on TV, you are a leader. You're making decisions for yourself. We, we, we expand that into how do we deal with adversity? How do we deal with problems? How do we set goals and then create a plan to go after those goals? That is leading yourself. 70% of leadership is leading yourself. And if you can do that successfully, especially through problems, hardship, adversity, that's when you will find success in your life. And Overcome really lays that out. 